Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. Hi. Uh. Hello. <laughs> hello and welcome to another uh well, our first episode of Let's Keep Chatting Season 2. Uh, I'm Lisa and this is Elric and we're from Five Centre of Qualities. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and today we are chatting with Gail from Enable Scotland. Hi. Hello, Gail. <laughs> uh, the podcast is about community groups or organisations from around five and we chat about what they're doing to help people from different equality groups and how they're dealing with poverty and how they're coping with the current COVID-19 situation. Yeah, you'll be able to find the podcast on our website and it's also going to be on YouTube. And uh, if you need subtitles or captions, you just click on the CC button and you'll be able to see it there. Okay, let's so let's chat about Enable Scotland. Gail, can you tell us a bit about the organisation and the role that you have within us? Yep, so the organisation was set up originally by a few families who had children on, well, children who had learning disabilities um, and they were needing some support um, and they felt that due to the, the disability movement that was in at the time, they wanted to look at how they could pull support together and come together um, and I think it was six families and it's just escalated from there and I think now we I would be I would be putting myself on the spot even about the, the amount of staff that Enable has. Um, and how we came about was they applied for some funding from the government when self-directed support came into play, you know, the mm -hmm. act, and we, we um, Enable successfully got funding for three years for Fife to cover the Fife area. And um, we, we applied for the posts and got the posts. Um, I started off as a coordinator, <coughs> excuse me, um, and then when my manager left, um, I was asked to be put, for, be put forward for the, the manager's post and, and I got the manager's post. So we were originally funded for three years, that was back in 2015, and we've got funding now up and our funding's been extended up until March 2022 um, with potential for possibly further funding. That's really good. I remember when uh, we met in 2015 and uh, it was a really interesting start of Enable at the time and you were connecting a lot of people about SDS. So can you talk a bit about SDS a bit a bit more maybe? Explain a yeah, bit so self-directed support is about the way that people's budgets are now um, delivered. But self-directed support is not just about budgets. You know, quite often we'll hear just talk about budgets. But self-directed support is the approach that every professional should be having in social care now. So it, it looks at the bigger picture, you know, where where people's skills are, their assets are, what um, um, dreams they've got for the future. And it looks about linking those up and looking at where these gaps are, where they need that extra bit of support. And then that's where the budget comes in to support people. Unfortunately, in Fife, the criteria is very, very tight for self-directed support. So people are not really getting pockets of, of funding or they might get small pockets, you know, maybe equating to maybe four or five hours a week or sometimes a bit less than that. So that's where some of the challenges are, you know, but um, if people do get a budget, then they have four options under self-directed support. So self-directed support is about putting people back in the driving seat around how they want that care provided. So before it used to be things like, you know, maybe day centres, you know, or, or something um, equivalent to that, that people would get the support from. But now they can look at creative solutions as to how that budget can be delivered. So. As I say, under self-direct support, and if you get a budget, there's four options. So option one is that you get a direct payment and you then can become the employer and you can employ your own PAs. And it works best if you know somebody in the community that can actually offer that support because you've already got that relationship built up, that rapport's built up. Um, but you can also get um, brokers, you know, as in like, accountants to manage that for you because it's quite daunting for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's the option. 
yeah, that's option one. Option two is where you can get a broker involved um, and they can do it all for you. And option three is the more traditional method where um, like the local authority will put everything in place for you so you don't have to deal with any of it. And then there's option four that you can try a wee bit of pick and mix. You can try a wee bit of option one, a wee bit of option three or, or whatever. Um, and then after your, everything's up and running, you should have a, a review six weeks later just to check that everything is working. And then from there, you should have a review again at six months and then they go on to annual reviews. Mm -hmm. But if anything changes within your circumstances, you can ask for a review at any time. You have to have social work involved to do the, the planning, you know, and, and do the assessment process. But that's where we come in and we can support families through that because it's quite or people who are, are you know, looking for a budget because it's quite good for them to have that information from an independent project mm -hmm. prior to having that discussion with social work so that they know the sort of questions that will be asked and they're prepared for for that sort of, you know, the assessment process. All right. So you mean, so, so when you would work with families mainly with uh, learning disability or across the disability spectrum or what, what? The first three years of our funding was um, for people who had learning disabilities or learning difficulties, mm -hmm. um, ASD, which is on the autistic spectrum or ADHD. Our second round of funding, we were told by our funders that um, we are open to anybody who can access a social care budget. Okay. So that opened the floodgates for us, you know, because really we don't turn anybody away now. Mm -hmm. So we can work with anybody. So you've been able to get more people, you've been able to help more people because of this second part of the funding yeah. being able. Yeah, and, and I should have said that, you know, we're funded by um, CERT, which is supporting the right direction, that's through the government. Um, and there are 29 other independent projects across Scotland, but they all do things a bit differently from us. We're a bit of a unique project mm -hmm. um, and we're only managed by Enable. So that makes us a, an independent project, whereby if people feel that they're not getting the outcomes that they would really like, we can help them to um, gain a bit of confidence, um, have a bit of advocacy there to help them challenge um, any kind of decisions that they're not happy with. So that's created a, a lot of changes in how the whole social care kind of provision is, is delivered and, and it's, a, it's quite new to a lot of families. So I guess a lot of that is talking to families about actually you can you can see things in a different way. You can you can work with but closer to you, closer to what works for you. But th there was always a problem, uh, which is uh, the lack of social uh, of personal assistance or of care workers. Um, so how does that work? Is it possible? We, we know that services across Fife, um, and I've been doing a wee bit of national work over COVID through our, we've got a new service up and running um, called Family Connect, which, you know, talk about a bit later. But um, services across Fife and, and nationally now are, are at capacity, you know, so if people want to go with option three and quite often because we've built up a rapport with families mm -hmm. or the people we're working with, they, they automatically want to go with enable them because of that rapport that's already built up. But we're finding that services under option three are all at capacity just now. So people are being more forced to, and I use that term forced, you know, um, to look at another option and go and advertise and recruit their own PAs, which is not the option that they want to go with because it's quite overwhelming for some people mm -hmm. to become in their own employer. So, um, so that is something as an organisation that I think going forward, we're going to have to look at how we support people who still want, you know, the services put involved and who don't want to have their own PAs. So we're going to have to look at that going forward. Is that something that's mainly since the pandemic, since COVID, or has it been ramping up for a while? Uh, yeah, it, it's been a common theme, you know, and, and during the pandemic, I've been supporting families to advertise for PAs and I've been supporting them to interview online 
um, for PAs as well, which has been a bit of a challenge because you're speaking to somebody who, you know, before the pandemic couldn't do team meetings, couldn't do Zoom meetings, you know, and <laughs> major panic around technology. Um, so that's been a real big step for us, you know, being able to interview and successfully get things set up and you know, supporting families around that and what that might look like. So, um, so yeah, we've been doing that with a few families. How, how have the families been coping, ad adapting to using technology more with yourselves? You know, has it become an issue Con, you know, with connections and there, there's some families we have that are not connected. You know, and and we've been looking at that, um, and we've we've um, linked up with a local resource, a, a local um, project who have been supplying um, free laptops. You know, reconditioned laptops. So families who are in poverty and, you know, again, around COVID, you know, with home educating, if they don't have access for kids getting online, then we've been able to get them free laptops, um, reconditioned laptops to support that. Um, some families don't want to do the remote, you know, and, and again, you've got some people or some families who they'll come on to something like this, you know, on remotely, but they don't want to have their camera on, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got some families who prefer just to do telephone calls and get support, you know, on a regular basis through a telephone call. So it, it depends. Some families love it. Some families hate it. And um, I think it was a bit of a novelty way back at the beginning. And I think we're starting to find that some families feel that they're zoomed out, you know, and, and they're struggling mm -hmm. now with technology and they just, they've, they've kind of had enough. So um, we've supported quite a lot of families as well to have meetings with school, you know, for their children because a lot of kids have been struggling with their anxiety, they've been disengaging with school and things. So um, in order to, to you know, have that complete approach, we've been supporting families to have meetings and, and advocate for families at, I mean, for school meetings and things as well, or meetings with social work and things. Um, so it's been working that way quite successfully. How how have you been feeling, Gail, during this period? You know, are you, are you zoomed out yourself? <laughs> are you zoomed out? <laughs> you know, um, I can see pros and cons. You know, for for we we were into lockdown a week before the the national lockdown came in. Um, I remember being away that weekend up at Aberfeldy, and my manager over the weekend had been texting and emailing and saying, "Can I get access to this? And you know, can we make links and?" You know, can you send me this information? And within that weekend, by the Monday, um, the Monday night, then we were told that that's us in lockdown. We are now working from home. Um, so Enable were very on the ball and they had everything in place within a weekend to, you know, like Teams um, installed on our laptops and everything so that we could work remotely. It has been a bit of a challenge, um, but I think we before the lockdown we had a, a wee bit of a waiting list because there is only myself and um, we've got a part-timer and I've got a full-time member of staff on the team so we cover the whole of five so it's a big geographical area um, and before the lockdown we had a bit of a, um, a, a waiting list but during the lockdown we don't have a waiting list we have been able to work with everybody that's been referred to us to do something with them, you know, because everybody at the moment is feeling things really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through periods where we've been, you know, a bit quiet, but then things just really took off. And before Christmas, um, since the start of the lockdown up till Christmas, we had a over 100 new referrals, which wow. was, was a lot for two and a half members of staff. So is that... Is that your whole team or do you have volunteers as well? No, that's a whole team. Right, that's um, a whole team. So, um, so yeah, you know, and, and I guess, you know, there, there's that wee bit of comfort around, you know, you're in your bubble and, you know, you're kind of safe in that bubble, you know, but um, a lot of our families don't want us to go out at the moment, you know, and, and we were able to go out and do some garden visits or go for a walk with people in the park, you know, that type of thing. Um, but now we've we've had to pull right back because of the the new variation of COVID. Um, 
And, you know, you, you do get families who say, no, I don't want anybody to come out, you know, and we've got families who um, have a budget and we're having support, but they're now saying, I don't want people to come out because we've got health problems, we don't know where they've been, they've been in different homes. So some people are quite comfortable. So basically, in answer to your question, Lisa, we're, we're really driven by the people that we support. So we we focus on what the outcomes are for them and how we can maybe creatively work to support them in the way that they want support it. But at the moment, we've just kind of pulled back again and that, you know, we've, we've been told that we can't even go into our office. You know, there's just nothing. Um, Enable are quite strict around keeping mm -hmm. everybody safe. So that's where we're at at the moment. So what kind of... Um... So from from the different families you work with, if if that's okay to share, is there is there some recurring difficulties that you think they are facing? So is it this question of trying to stay safe, not wanting to do things, but trying to stay safe at the same time? So there's a kind of hesitation there, maybe. I don't it's know. It's changed a wee bit since the back, beginning of the lockdown. Um, you know, the first lockdown. Um, a way back at the beginning, we had people who were shielding. You know, and we supported them to get their their. Um, you know, their, their food packages from the government, you mm -hmm. know, um, things like that to helping families and carers get PPE, you know, if they were entitled to PPE, you know, all that sort of thing. So um, in this second time round, there's not that, you know, of course, there's still some people are way back on the shielding list and things, um, yeah, but PPE yeah. is more readily available and, and things. So, you know, it's slightly different now. We've had some families who um, their children are, are, are just completely disengaging with school due to their anxieties, you know, and, and for youngsters on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, this is normality for them. This is, you know, quite a lot of them have, parents have said, they love this lockdown because this is what they don't want to engage with the outside world, you know, so this is ideal. Um, and and then... If, yeah, and then if, if they've been at home for a period of time, like during the lockdown, then they've got heightened anxiety about going back to school. And then we've had some families come to us, you know, looking for a place for their children at the hub, you know, because their, their child has additional needs or maybe a parent's working, you know, they're a frontline worker, you know, something like that. So we've been intervening and advocating for them to get them a place at hubs. Mm -hmm. um, we've been having online meetings, you know, I've been working with a couple of youngsters who have been at risk of being um, taking off their course at college and, and we've supported them around, you know, making sure that they've, they've, they've got that place at college and how the college needs to support them a bit more. Um, we've been doing a bit of person-centred planning online with youngsters, you know, and having face-to-face -face meetings with them, you know, virtual meetings. So. It, We've been challenging decisions around people with their budgets, you know, where they're feeling that they're not, you know, maybe that, that there's a risk of them getting their budgets taken back because they're not using them, you know, or can they use them in a more creative way than what they've been doing, you know, um, or what they will do, you know, post-pandemic. We've been supporting families who have been in crisis, you know, their support's been withdrawn for whatever reason. Um, and looking at alternative solutions there as well. So it's been really varied and very diverse. Yeah. There's been, from what we've been saying, at IFC, there's been like a lot of pockets where basically people have, have not been able to access uh, whatever social support networks that they had and the isolation was ramping up. So that's why I was asking, is it something that you, you've noticed as well, uh, this, this idea of isolation, but you're saying that actually, uh, in some ways, for um, families with children with uh, Asperger's or autism, actually, it is less stressful <laughs> to actually see a lot of people. It's it actually is slightly better, but it still creates the, the problem of, okay, how do we stay uh, in touch with education? How do we stay up with peers? So but there's different perspectives on all this. And that's really interesting to hear you say that, actually. And part of it is just making sure we keep those links open, mm -hmm. you know, so that, you know, and we say to a lot of families, you know, you don't have to have a child, you know, for like home educating, you don't have to have them sitting at a computer all day because if they're at school, they're not sitting, 
you know, at a desk all day, they're, they're engaging with friends out in the playground, you know, and they've got breaks, all that sort of thing. But we're encouraging families as well to look at um, alternatives, you know, look at doing some life skills. You know, if, if you have to go shopping, involve the youngster in the shopping, you know, a bit around home economics, well, you're doing the tea tonight, you know, and it's menu planning. And then when you go to the shop, you know, you're, they're, they're supporting to buy the food, you know, there's the money situation involved and all that, you know, calculating what money they need, what change, you know, so we're, we're supporting families around looking at alternative education as well. So it's not just a case of sitting in front of a computer all day, you know, to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we'll, we've got a Facebook page, so we'll now and again put information up on that as well for families. So like um, BBC are doing a lot of stuff around education just now for youngsters as well. So yeah, you know, yeah, can start yeah. building up a timetable, you know, and engaging the youngster in a timetable. And, it, you know, it, what we've been saying to parents as well, it's, it's don't be too hard on yourself. You know, this is not normal times we're going through. This is different for everybody. Um, so it's just, you know, trying to support families and, and trying to support people as best we can to get the best outcome that they can at the moment. I think it's really keen to hear that. Uh, with homeschooling, we were talking about this. I think Lisa is going like, oh my gosh, here we go. I know, I was like, <laughs> I have a child that, he, 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 like, he doesn't have learning difficulties or anything, but he has issues where, at the moment, being homeschooled, he, 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 he admits to me, he says, I can't focus. Yeah. You know, it's in, it, it's like, I have to wait, like, halfway through the day for I can actually get him to focus. And it, you know, like, and yesterday was day one, and you know, he had like six subjects sent to him, sent to him stuff, and I think he only got one class done out of the six subjects. You know, but he's got the whole week to do it. But even so, it's I, I just want him to do learn how to do just bits at a time, kind of thing. You know, and I feel many parents, you know, and I have a friend who has a son that's on the autism spectrum and he's actually like you're saying some kids are up there enjoying to be homeschooled and find it easier to connect with the subject kind of thing mm -hmm. where my son he doesn't have that type of issue but he feels that if he was in school he would focus better kind of thing and if you 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 know remember when way back at the first um, lockdown, it was hard for us to motivate, you know, to say right, how is this going to be different, you know, and and you, when you think you're taking them away from their friends, just mm -hmm. everything that they've been really used to, and then sometimes you've got um, kids who they can't transfer that home, you know, school home the school work to home, you know, they compartmentalise as in that school, you don't do anything at home that's relating to school, you know, they, do, they don't cross over. Mm. So you've got that challenge as well then for parents, you know, and if parents are trying to work from home as well, you know, this is not working from home, we are having to home work, mm. you know, which is slightly different, you know, so everybody is juggling at the moment and everybody's just human. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got to the point where I just think, um, do the subjects that he likes the most and say get them out of the way first and then we'll work together on the subjects yeah. we're struggling with. Yeah, you know, and I don't go like the teachers are putting due dates up and I just don't go by them. I just sort of say as long as you've done the work and handed it in, you've done it kind of thing. And that's the main thing. As long as you do it before you're supposed to go back. <laughs> it's hard for everybody just now, you know, and I think we just have to be kind to ourselves and say we, we're only human, we can only do what we can. No, I do so much. So I praise all the teachers and, you know, the people support assistance, you know, and all that help. Because I know that some of the schools, if, if they're sending out messages where if you're having issues with the schoolwork and having to do remote learning, they're still there that, you know, you can phone them or even email them kind of yeah. thing and they'll phone you back kind of thing. 
And I have to admit, that, you know, as I said earlier, there's been pros and cons to this kind of working. Mm -hmm. And one of the pros for us is travelling between meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you, you've been able to have, four, you know, maybe four meetings in a day. Like, you know, I think at one point I've had five meetings in a day, you know, and that is exhausting. But you haven't had that travel, which is has allowed you, you know, whereas if you're working, you know, in, in an office environment, you're having to go out to meetings, three is a maximum you could do in, in a day. And that's exhausting because you're traveling. Because yes. you might be going like miles and miles. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel that it's it's so much easier to get um, lots of professionals around the table this way because their diaries are not quite as hectic, you know, they're not quite as full because they're not travelling to places as well. So th that's been a pro, you know, for some families you've been, you know, if we've had like school meetings, you've had educational psychology and, you know, specific health um, professionals all around the table, whereas you would never get that and, you know, and, and, and a, what, you know, the, the real world that we have been working in previously. So that has been a real pro as well, that you've been able to get, you know, everybody around the table at one go. Yeah, yeah. more communication yeah. this way. Yeah. And I think partnership working has been a lot better as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's been much better partnership working because you can do it this way and you can tie people down, you know, pin them down to have meetings and things as opposed to trying to, you know, ships passing in the night, not being able to get people on the boat, you know, all that type of thing. So I think it's opened up other avenues for that as well. That's definitely something that we picked up on as well. It's been like, um, it's it's always it has allowed groups to, to not work with the same habits. So suddenly there'll be like local networking, but actually, yeah, there was no reason why it was not happening before. Technically, it just didn't happen. Now it has to happen. So it's, it's just, yeah. you're just getting on with it. So yeah, so um, yeah. So if there's any examples like that you'd like to share, do, do tell us because we, we've seen some amazing work, like I uh, think, like food banks working with mosques using their uh, uh, their, their kitchens because we were just quite close to each other. We had like uh, local food groups just basically just complementing each other. We had crossovers between health and homeless services and so yeah it, it's it's definitely been really challenging since since the lockdown but it's also helping professionals in some ways to to create those links but technically we could have done those before shouldn't we but it was just the fix in the way <laughs> yeah. i think one of the negative things about doing this work is you don't have that Right, that's me finished, you know, when, you know, my sort of job, it's flex, my, my job's flexible um, because sometimes, you know, you'll maybe work in, in the evenings to support families who have maybe been working and things. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, normally when you were, you know, post-COVID, eh, pre-COVID, you would be, you know, sort of saying, well, five o'clock at night, that's me, you know, starting to wind down or that's me finished now, I'm out of the office. And the journey home would be a good time to reflect on what you've done during the day mm -hmm. or doing that in between meetings. Whereas now it's a case of you just kind of keep working until you're finished. Mm -hmm. You know, and like last night, it was about quarter past nine because um, I was doing a bit of partnership work in last night with a group. So, you know, it was quarter past nine that I finished last night, you know, and you're back to your normal hours the next day. So, you know, I think that's one of the negatives that you have to be really kind to yourself and say, you know, I have to switch off here because you're no good to your families or the people that you're working with if you mm -hmm. don't look after yourself as well. So that's been one of the negative things, I think. And you don't have a kind of break as well like driving home or walking back home or something like that to create that kind of barrier yeah. as well you, and, and you don't take the holidays the same either you know that's right. because you're not going anywhere so you know you've got those restrictions so it's a case of no i don't take holidays you know and then you've got all those holidays piling up or or toil you know piling up that you're you're not using either so you know, it is, um, and I have to say, Enable is very good at that, you know, making sure that you're looking after your own well-being. Um, and we've got various things internal, you know, to support us around that as well, that if we need a bit of extra support. So they have been really good that way. But there is pros and cons, you know. Um, mm. to, and I think one of the big 
um, pros as well is looking at using this time appropriately to revisit where we are and where the project is and what we can do better or what we can offer more at the other side, you know, of, of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and kind of, you know, as I say, we're kind of led by the people that we support. So it's all around what, what are they looking for and what we can do post pandemic, you know, and, and take things forward. So things during the pandemic that we have done to, to reach, you know, as many people as we can is we have um, set up our Facebook page so we've got that up and running now where we'll put, you know, stuff on the, maybe local community connections and things, you know, things that people need to do um, or need to know about. Um, there, there could be things like these like accessible information around the new COVID restrictions, you know, when we go through different tiers. Okay. We've also been um, doing, um, which we started off monthly and we've kind of gone every quarter now, um, a newsletter. And what we did was some of the, the closer partnerships that we have with other organisations or projects, we've asked them to come together with us and put stuff in our newsletter. So mm -hmm. then that we're reaching an even bigger target audience, you know, we can support more people. So, you know, it, it would be like an advocacy service or um, Scottish Autism, you know, things like that. And they would all give us a wee bit of what's going on in their project at the moment. And then that would once we had collated it all together um, and published it properly um, in, a, in a, a, you know, a more accessible format and things, what we would do then is send it out to everybody that's, that's put information in our newsletter. So it then goes out to all those, those families that they're supporting as well and not just our families. So it gets out there to a much bigger and wider audience as well. So we're that's reaching great. a lot more people. That's, really so good. That, that's been successful. So we can share that. So, can people sign up to the newsletter through your website or through Facebook page, or what's the way to do What it? we do is um, we send it out to the families that we're working with, but we'll also put it on, and it's done through Sway. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, we've got our, our media team at head office that, that, you know, do it properly for us. Um, and then we usually put the link on Twitter or we'll put the link on Facebook, and then people who Follow us that we can can access it as well that way. Okay, um, no, that sounds good. We'll definitely share the link for that. Sounds okay, good. excellent. So, what's happening at the moment? Is there things that we can do? Because you know, I'm still sticking to that. There's two and a half of you <laughs> working across five. So, what kind of uh, support is useful? What, what kind of things uh, can be uh, relevant for you at this time because it sounds like uh, you don't see you don't stop working till nine late at night <laughs> yeah. I think it's just really promoting our service at the moment you know um, and you know if there's there's other you know keeping us up to date with any kind of community stuff that comes up you know because quite often what we do is we're we're we've been described before as being sort of the lead person you know, and, and what we do is we bring, you know, different professionals together and, and we open up those conversations and build those relationships for families and things. So it's kind of, you know, just keeping us abreast of what's out there, anything new, any new organisations or, you know, any information we need to know, that sort of thing. So that, I mean, it's really hard for us to keep lots of information in our heads all the time, you know, and, and quite often, you know, if we get a family, we'll say we're, we're a bit stuck, you know, and somebody else in our team will say, remember so-and-so though, you know, um, but there's too much out there for us to keep on top of and keep in our heads all the time. So I guess, you know, it, it's just promoting what we do. Um, and, and what I said earlier is that um, Enable's got some stuff going on as well that we have just set up at head office, um, I think called Family Connect. Mm -hmm. um, and what that is, is a, is a sort of drop-in session on a Thursday night for parents or for, um, you know, people who want to come along, carers, you know, that sort of thing. And we have various different seminars. So I've done a seminar on self-directed support and it's national, you know, it's across Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've had um, 
somebody that, that does um, education law for parents and carers, you know, and, um, and then we've had um, a local girl who I've been working with who's got a hearing impairment and she's she's done a, a signing session, you know, for parents and carers um, for sign language. So there's various different things and, and there's resources available to, to parents and carers as well about different topics. Um, so I guess, you know, it's just about, you know, what you guys could maybe do is just help promote some of that stuff, you know, sure. so that people have access. And a lot of, of people, it's about knowing where they can turn. You know, um, we were speaking to a, a parent last night and our son has just had a, a diagnosis in November, an autism diagnosis. And it's like, you know, you're given the diagnosis and it's like, that's it. You oh. know, but they're not given any information what, about what do you do with face? Yeah. Uh, where you can go for a wee bit of support or information or anything. So it's just really getting that word out there that we're a good starting point, you know, for people to and if we're not the right service, then what we would do is we would signpost them to a more appropriate service or or somebody that's more expert in something than what we are. You know, we're not territorial around what we do it's about getting people the best support possible mm -hmm. so you know i guess it's just kind of keeping us you know aware of what's out there but also you know promoting what we can do as well um you know going forward we will we'll get all these things from you and we'll include it as a post afterwards following okay. this so yeah. that i can everyone's listening can just see exactly where these are so yeah i'll make sure okay So how's the, um, so can people just go on the website and ask to be a volunteer, you know? We haven't really taken volunteers simply because of um, the, the data protection GDPR. So obviously if you've got people volunteering for you, they, they would need to have access to everybody's details and things. So, um, for our project we we have had a couple of volunteers as in young people that you know have been looking for a wee bit of work experience and we've you know they've, they've done a wee bit of admin work with us but we have to be really careful around how we protect people's details the information that that we store and things on on our um our system we don't do any kind of paperwork whatsoever everything is on our system so you know for for taking on volunteers we would need to look at how we break down those barriers and what those challenges are around uh, uh, gdpr for them okay. uh, there was a lot of i think local hubs or emergency networks and uh resilience networks that were developed uh, where i am towards the east there's been a few of them as well but as you say the, the <laughs> The safety risk was a mega issue. So yeah. having to balance people that do want to help, we're actually keeping everyone safe, especially if you're trying to, to do an organization around it. So that's a fair point. So that sounds really good. So your call out, I would say then, is definitely share the information with as many groups as, as possible and try and uh, keep connected. Definitely trying to advertise things. So I will definitely put that forward in uh, and we might invite you to write a wee blog about how things have been going. Well, that's why not. <laughs> if you... Yeah, and, and just picking up on what you were saying about volunteers is that, you know, we've also, in Fife, we've also got an employability project that mm -hmm. works with people to get into employment and things or, or you know, and, and we can support as well. Like we had a referral through this morning around voluntary work, you know, and, and helping people to support them to find some voluntary work. And that's all the sort of things that we do, you know, um, so it's not necessarily them coming to work with us, but if this is the sort of environment that they want to work in, you know, and, and get voluntary work or, or experience in, we can support them to look at what that looks like. Um, and, and, you know, we're very keen to, uh, the way that we work is very person-centred. So it's not one size fits all. So what's right for one person wouldn't maybe be right for somebody else, you know, and it's about engaging with that person and looking at how, what their dreams are, how we can break that down, you know, bite sized, um, small steps and, and, you know, helping them onto that, that on the path for that dream going forward. So 
you know, of whatever age that is from very young and, and even, you know, we're, we're working with people who are, are difficult, you know, or, or there's challenges there to engage with them. You know, we, we work around how to break that down and how to get in there and, and work with people as well. So, um, so that's, yeah. that's, that's open at the moment, Selwyn. Yeah, yeah, um, there's still some sort of volunteering opportunities out there and, and our employability team in the area, you know, they've got a wee bit of a waiting list, but um, they're still, you know, doing what they can and, and what they do is they, they support people, young people to look at the employment and how to get them into employment, but they also support the employer to make the, the employment sustainable for the young person as well. So. Um, and we've also got, you know, one of the employability workers who have recently been doing um, a, a project around looking at, you know, for youngsters going through transitions um, from school to, to college or, or from leaving school, uh, leaving college as well. Um, they've been doing a wee bit of work around that to look at how youngsters with um, you know, ESD or, or learning disability or whatever, how they can get into employment so that transition isn't just an automatic, you're leaving school, you're going to college. They, they can ha have opportunities just like everybody else. So sometimes what happens is, you know, if they're going on the college route, they're losing out on an apprenticeship. And we want to have, you know, possibly workers in schools, transition workers, to have those conversations around, do you want to go into employment just now? It's not just a ticky box that you have to go into college if that's not that's not the right direction for you. So it's all very, very person-centred that enable, you know, their approach. And, and that's very much at the heart of everything we do and how we can break down those barriers for people. Mm -hmm. And we work with the whole family as well. We're not just there for the person. We, you know, we look at the siblings, you know, and there's their support that we need to look at for the siblings or for parents, you know, and we've got access to, to financial advisors that, you know, can look at making sure they're claiming everything they should. So we are a, a well-rounded, sort of diverse service that we can support families. And as I say, if they're not the right service, we find the right service for them. So what's the best way to contact yourselves? Um, so all that we ask, if, if anybody can contact us directly or okay. any professionals can make a referral in, if professionals are making a referral, all that we ask is that the person they're referring in knows that they're making that referral and are happy to be referred and then we'll contact them from there. So it can just be a phone call to us or it can be an email just with the the referrals name and contact details, maybe a wee bit about the, the situation, but what you normally find is that once you phone them, their circumstances or what they're looking for is maybe different from what the referral has, you know, put in in the refer um, when they've been referring them on. So um but that's that's all we, we did have a referral form but it's very SDS -y. So, um, you know, if people are not looking for a budget, it's very hard to fill out that form. So, yeah, just whatever works for people. So we can just ring or drop you an email or something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we just ask that whoever, you know, is being referred on, that they know they're being referred and they're happy for that. OK, um, thank you for coming along today, Gail. And explaining everything about Enable Scotland and how to get in contact with your group and everything. Um, we'll put up links and everything about the group and <laughs> Elwick's happy about that and blog. <laughs> oh, very important. <laughs> blog is very important. <laughs> Talk about what you're doing, it's really important. You need to know. Right. So, thank you for being our first episode of season two for this year. Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Season yeah. two already. What, what I know. <laughs> so. Season one just went like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. No, it's really so. good. Really good to catch up with you, Gail. So thank you very much for being here. No, thank you. Yeah. It's been good. Thank you for coming along today and everything. So catch up soon. Hopefully. <laughs> <That's all good. laughs> and Lisa, your internet stayed this time. So well done as well. <laughs> <laughs> First episode that I've not
disappeared. <laughs> yeah, it connected two, three times in the previous one. So it's improvement. So uh, that's the thing. So 2021 made me better as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The 11th vote. The 11th vote, don't we? Made me better. Yes. So that sounds good. So this yeah. this will come out this Thursday. So uh, we send you all the links and everything. And that's brilliant. So it will be on podcast and uh, on YouTube as well. So you get all the links right soon. Good stuff. Great. Great. Thank you very Great. much. All the right. best. Thank you. All Thank the best you. Bye.